Coming up next on Tech News Today, Apple's Tim Cook calls the EU ruling on paying back taxes to Ireland political crap. Also, iCloud is about to add a two terabyte storage option. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket exploded on the launch pad today with Facebook's satellite in tow. Uh, more stuff from IFA in Berlin, including a gold-plated Sony Walkman and Steve Jobs' secondhand clothes are now up for auction. You can get it for yourself and support a charity in the process. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1590, recorded Thursday, September 1st, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Trunk Club. Get clothes that fit and look amazing without ever stepping into a store again. Trunk Club will help you create the wardrobe you've always dreamed of with your own personal stylist. Go to trunkclub.com slash TNT and join Trunk Club today. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen rate and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT for 30% off your entire order. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about everything that happened in technology today. Today. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. Um, what did happen today? A lot. I think I missed it. <laughs> you did? I think you're going to have to do the show without me because I don't remember what happened No, today. no. You, uh, you're going to talk about Apple. Oh, that's yeah. right. I'm going to talk about Apple. <laughs> and then you're going to talk about... Uh, Google. Driving yeah. things. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. We can do this. Mm -hmm. We can do this. I, can. I have a feeling once we start talking about Apple, it's all going to fall into place. So let's mm -hmm. do that right now. Two days after the EU ruled that Apple owes Ireland 13 billion euros, that's 14 point five billion dollars by the way in unpaid taxes apple ceo tim cook spoke with ireland's independent newspaper where he called the decision quote political crap cook said uh these are his words they just picked a number from i don't know where and personally my words i think i know where he's insinuating they picked that number from <laughs> officials uh fired back by saying they used apple's own figures that they were provided, uh, that were basically provided directly to them from Apple, as well as pulled from a related U.S. Senate hearing uh, from years back. Cook told another Irish broadcaster, RTE, that the company might bring much of that money back into the U.S. beginning next year. So Apple holds about $215 billion in cash and other liquid investments mm -hmm. o offshore. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if I uh, support Apple, I'm in a tough spot here. If I support Apple, a lot of people will just be like, oh, she's an Apple fangirl. But the... <sighs> there is a huge tax liability mm -hmm. if you bring money offshore back in the United States. It's a weird system um, and it needs to be reformed. And again, like I, you know, I think corporations get a lot of breaks in the U.S. and um, I think that's unfortunate in some way, but there needs to be some corporate tax reform. And I think that's what Cook is getting at. Yeah. Um, it seems self-serving because it's a lot of money that his company needs to pay, but it doesn't make sense. No other place does it like we do it in the United States. And it's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He actually says that he expects, he expects Ireland to do the right thing and appeal the decision, uh, appeal rather against the decision. Um, so obviously Apple's going to appeal. Uh, Ireland's finance minister, uh, says that he is critical of this decision. So there's certainly a lot of uh, negativity towards the, the the ruling. And I mean, obviously it serves, like you said, it serves Tim Cook and Apple to be opposed to this, uh, both on a political front, you know, as, as far as why does this even exist? And for monetarily for them, they stand to lose a lot of money. The EU, just, just to kind of refresh on this, charges that Apple was allowed to pay between one to no, to almost no percent of taxes uh, on European profits between 2003 to 2014. That's such a long period of time for something like this to happen and then be like, oh, well, actually, yeah, we're going to turn that around. Mm -hmm. So, 
Well, yesterday, Google was moving into Uber's territory by launching a carpooling service through the Waze app. But don't look now, because today, Chinese company Baidu is stepping on Google's toes by getting into autonomous vehicle testing permit area. They got a permit from the California Department of Motor Vehicles. Their new team of 100 engineers will be hitting the streets with their self-driving cars in Google's own Silicon Valley. At the Baidu World Conference today in Beijing, Baidu and NVIDIA CEO also announced a partnership to use artificial intelligence to create a cloud to car autonomous car platform for local Chinese and global taxi services. They'll work on mapping and level three autonomous vehicle control and automated parking. Level three autonomy. So what is that? That's um, autonomous in some but not all scenarios. Basically it's like a human you know obviously is there isn't closely monitoring the driving like hands on the steering wheel, sort of like Tesla level, um, but should be available to take over as needed as situations arise. So not full autonomy uh, as far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. And NVIDIA has been working on this along these lines for at least the last couple of years. You'd mentioned, um, well, in, in kind of reading through this, Drive PX is one effort that they launched, they introduced, I think, last year or two years ago. And that's basically a $10,000 computer uh, f built four cars so that they can learn the right and wrong reactions to scenarios. Kind of sounds like this whole machine learning thing that we're always talking about on the show. Uh, 12 onboard cameras to kind of capture video and, you know, kind of determine things like you, you would slow down for a person or a car, or sorry, for a person or a dog, let's say, but you wouldn't slow down when a newspaper is flying across the street mm -hmm. or something along those lines. So they've been playing around with this for a while. Yeah, so DrivePX is the computer that's that's uh, big enough to process all this, and mm -hmm. you're talking about like an additional $10,000 just for that. Um, it does look more and more like these are not going to be the, you know, the self-driving cars aren't going to be the ones we go to the dealership and, and buy. They're going to be taxis. They're going to be stuff that we share. We're not all going to have our own car. Uber, Uber's going to own them all. Or Google or yeah. Baidu or right. GM or anyone. I mean, a lot of companies have autonomous permits. Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, Google, Delphi uh, Automotive, Tesla, Bosch, Nissan, GM Cruise, LLC, BMW, Honda Ford, Zooks Incorporated, Drive AI, and Faraday Future all have permits to test autonomous cars. At this point, you have to imagine the ones that aren't on that list, although that's pretty that's a pretty comprehensive list, mm -hmm. uh, off the top of my head anyways. Uh, the ones that aren't probably will soon because it seems to be the way of the world right now mm -hmm. in, in automotive. But this, uh, this and other partnerships are not necessarily for their own cars, but they will give this system to like a Toyota or something, mm -hmm. someone that, that isn't building their own self-driving car. Right. Just put it in the trunk or something. <laughs> yeah. Sandwich it back. So it's going to be the add-on when you go to the dealer and they're like, uh, do you want the top coat? Uh, do you want the self-driving car, you know, thing? <laughs> self-driving car, $10,000 computer in the back. Right. Can, we th can we just throw that in for you? With the, yeah. A little add-on. Uh, YouTube is no stranger to excessively strong language and risque content. It's also no stranger to ads that make YouTubers lots of money. Not to mention YouTube's parent company, Alphabet. But some popular YouTubers are starting to worry that YouTube might be starting to uh, clamp down on content if it's deemed to be unfriendly to advertisers. Philip DeFranco, he's a YouTuber who's been on the network for a full decade, has around 4.5 million subscribers currently. Uh, he noticed that his most recent episode, at least he started to notice with this, of the Philip DeFranco show was hit with a restriction that prevented it from being monetizable uh, with ads due to, they say, excessively strong language. And then when he started going in and looking, he noticed more than a dozen, and I think at this point, somewhere around 40 of his older videos, suddenly over, you know, over the time that he was looking, being tagged. And that basically prevents those from being monetized. Uh, the reason behind it in this case was tied to his inclusion on, on the, on the mo thing that initially got him to look into it, tied to his inclusion of controversial or sensitive subjects, they say, uh, even if the graphic imagery isn't shown, which kind of, you know, he's calling this censorship, but again, points out that it's within YouTube's right. It's part of the terms of service, but it is kind of, an interesting way to go in the sense that YouTube, you know, maybe it's maybe it's not, let's say, swear words, or maybe an advertiser has a specific problem with this, 
you know, with, with this type of content, graphic content of, of some degree. But if it's like his show is, which is talking about news topics, really, a, a lot of it is just kind of covering the, the big news of the day uh, in certain facets of the Internet. Um, in this case, it ends up being, well, we don't like that news. That news is unsavory, let's say, uh, like the Chris Brown video from a couple of days ago. Like that was part of the content mm. there. And uh, this is YouTube or maybe it's the advertisers basically saying we don't want to sponsor uh, that type of content. Well, I mean, YouTube has said that it's really just a conflict between the rules and their, uh, well, actually, what I think this is is just a conflict between the rules and their execution. You know, mm -hmm. they're like, we have all these rules. Um, they're not being executed the way they should. YouTube has said, we're just trying to give creators a way to say like, hey, some of your content might not be appropriate for advertisers. So you might lo start losing money. Here's a way to, um, to say that's not true. So like the vlog brothers, um, you know, who have, you know, Hank, Hank Green, um, they had a video about refugees mm -hmm. and they got one of those things mm -hmm. and, and they, and they just clicked on a link and said, this isn't, you know, about us. And of course, like they're huge. I mean, Hank Green was interviewed by Obama. Like they're, he's one of the biggest YouTubers. I'm guessing he has a little bit of different access, but that's what they were kind of saying. Like, oh, you know, because we're so, YouTube is so far beyond the, there's not someone in a room like watching everything. Yeah. Like you would you know if you could had to watch everything on YouTube like it would be <laughs> I don't know I mean it'll be like thousands of people all of their lives I don't I don't even know the numbers it'd be crazy so they're yeah. depending on algorithms or depending on people reporting it so yeah I um it's tricky though it that's tricky that must be a big part of it is the mm -hmm. whole reporting on it factor because yeah. who's going who's going to you know actually view the content and make the determination of whether this is you know um okay to you know for everyone or whether it's very specific and you know some people aren't going to appreciate this content or whatever yeah some of the other content like depression there were there were videos on depression there were videos on like acne treatment um so it's it's hard to know and i think for, so uh correct me if i'm wrong but what you're saying is this is more of a warning from youtube that it might happen not necessarily that it will happen and you won't get any more monetization i think so then you just there here's how you respond to it yeah so they can, and they can kind of go go back and appeal the whole right. process and hopefully get it reversed mm -hmm. so this youtuber that you're talking about who philip defranco who brought this um to the news he was calling it censorship right and i think that i disagree with that because like the sopranos uh, was not appropriate for regular network television where advertisers are. So they had to go to HBO. Is that censorship? You know, mm -hmm. no, no I, I don't think it is. Um, you know, there's some content that is more appropriate for a different medium. Um, you know, their advertisers want to sell to families. They want to sell, and I'm not saying like that, no, protect the kids on YouTube, get all this stuff off. I'm not just, I'm not saying that, but that I think YouTube has to mature in this way um, just like network television is has matured. I mean, that's why we have all these, um, you know, networks where more adult shows can be on, mm -hmm. and there are some are supported by advertising, and some are, you know, paid for cable like HBO. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, and you hear this a lot with uh, services like Twitter, for example, and you know, Twitter has a history of saying that they are pro, you know, a pro free speech. <clears throat> and so maybe that's why they, they find themselves under the microscope a little bit more in the whole pre, free speech slash censorship uh, cut topic that continues to kind of arise around them as they clamp down on things, you know, that are happening with their network that they don't think should be happening. Mm -hmm. That always ends up being the kind of the knee jerk kind of uh, reaction to that as well. You're censoring and you used to say that that you wouldn't do that. I mean, the, the reality is, I suppose it's YouTube's uh, playing field. And so, you know, you're invited to play, but by their rules and the terms of service do say that this could happen. And YouTube seems to be saying, you know, this, this may have been happening before. We just didn't do a good job of notifying you about it. Now we're telling you so that you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you remember the debacle of when they launched YouTube for kids? Mm -hmm. um, the oh, app, yeah. It was just like, it was a mess. Like they, you know, every, they, lots of videos that were inappropriate for kids snuck in. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the problem was how much advertising they had on there. You know, it wasn't regulated in the same way that television was regulated. So clearly, I mean, they have some work to do. Yeah, they only recent, I mean, along those lines, they only recently just activated um, YouTube Red for the kids thing. So uh -huh. uh, the, the kids app. And so now you can get rid of 
those those kinds of ads. Of course, so much of YouTube is not those kinds of ads. It's ads that are built into the content. And there's, you know what I mean? Like uh, product product placement, that sort of stuff. You see a lot of that. I mean, we're, we're kind of an example. We have ads within the show, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not something that uh, that you can remove with a an automated YouTube thing mm -hmm. uh, like this. Well, that, uh, you bring up YouTube Red. I hadn't thought about that either because, I mean, that is, you pay for that. So mm -hmm. maybe that's, maybe that is what YouTube is aiming for like hey do you have like more adult content like maybe you want to be on on this place that uh where people have to pay instead of depending on advertisers yeah um i don't think youtube red has a lot of i mean i don't think it's been doing like smashingly well or anything well it's, so. it's hard to know because it's tied in with uh play music subscriptions and on android if you're on android and you're paying for a music subscription i mean you you know there's a lot of spotify users but there's also a lot of play music uh subscribers and so it's hard to know because those lines are totally blurred. YouTube Red and Play Music uh, could be two completely separate services that you pay for. They just happen to be collect, you know, combined. So who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> who knows if it's a success or not? Well, Apple is adding a two terabyte option to its cloud storage service, which is leading many to suspect that a 256 gigabyte iPhone will be announced next week. The largest iCloud storage plan is always eight times the amount of the largest iPhone. Little known fact, 256 mm. gigabytes is eight times eight is 2,048 gigabytes. That's just a little bit over two terabytes. Uh, either way, that is a lot of puppy photos. It costs $19.99 a month, which is in line with Google's one terabyte a month service. It starts at $9.99 a month. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive than Windows, uh, which offers, Microsoft offers one terabyte for $6.99 a month. It's still a little bit expensive, I think, but for Apple users, it's really easy. Um, you know, it's just, it's completely integrated. It's all integrated and so I think that's yeah. what, that's what I use. I just use the, the cheapest tier and that's enough. I also have all my photos on Google photos and I also have, um, I use one care, what the Microsoft one that's left over. I don't One drive? One drive. It automatically, uh, uploads. I never look at it. I have no idea. Actually, You've got them all like, over the place. I got, I do. I don't want to lose any of my puppy photos. <laughs> I understand. I think the challenge on that is, um, then if one goes away or if you need to, like, let's say your local, uh, backup suddenly disappears and you need to pull from one of the services, which one is the most complete collection? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I should actually out. check my OneDrive because I can't even remember what OneDrive is called, so I don't actually know if it's still... <laughs> but if there's I, even anything going right, in Right, but whatever I had was free. I know that because they took it away, yeah. but then you, all you had to do was like sign up for something and then they gave you back. Mm -hmm. the, so, mm -hmm. but I, um, you can, you know, so you can already get a 256 gig iPad, so maybe that's why they're, they've upped the, the storage um, on iCloud, I don't know. Hmm. That's an interesting tell, though, that mm -hmm. uh, that the size uh, for iCloud correlates. Um, real quick before we move on, right uh, before the show, Scooter X and chat passed along late-breaking news uh, that Samsung is actually going to be recalling, reportedly is going to be recalling its global stock of Galaxy Note 7s. Uh, we talked yesterday about how there are battery explosion reports. You know, not a, not a huge amount, but... They're collecting online at this point. Samsung was investigating and and holding off on shipping its current stock because it wanted to uh, kind of make sure, you know, do some extra quality testing and all that kind of stuff. Well, reports, according to the South Korea's Yonhap uh, news agency, say that Samsung is contact, in contact with carriers right now to negotiate some sort of a strategy on returns. And, you know, we might hear something about this very soon about send back your Galaxy Note 7s. And if that's the case, man, that is horrible news for Samsung. Mm -hmm. Like it's just the worst timing possible. Like this is one of their marquee products. Uh, they, they have a lot of momentum right now. This is going to stop it in its tracks. Yeah, the note catches on fire, but we pay our taxes. Maybe that's what <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they don't. <laughs> Well, a SpaceX rocket exploded on the launch pad this morning. Charles Pulliam Moore from Fusion is here to explain what was destroyed. But first, let's take a minute to thank Trunk Club, the sponsor of this episode. I love new clothes, but I do not like shopping for them. And do not even get me started on shopping with my teenage daughter. It is not fun at all. If you have a teenage daughter, you know what I mean. Shopping is frustrating. You find yourself wandering from store to store only to find clothes that are ill-fitting or not what you are looking for. And now, thanks to Trunk Club, you can get clothes that 
look great and fit perfectly without ever stepping into a store again. With Trunk Club, you can easily upgrade your wardrobe with fall essentials like blazers and button downs for men and sleeveless coats and sweater dresses for women. You just type in your measurements, share your style and spending preferences to connect with the right Trunk Club stylist for free. Your stylist will then contact you via phone, email, or messenger to understand your unique look and learn more about what you're looking for. I've been using Trunk Club for several months and I recently just started a profile for my daughter for back to school clothes that are appropriate, stylish, and in our budget. Carolyn is helping me out and it's great because I've been working with her and I, I can share all of the aggravation that I have shopping and what um, I think my daughter will want and she can look at it and if she doesn't want it, we'll just send it back. Your stylist will select items for your trunk from over 80 top brands and she'll send a preview of the clothes that may be a good fit. You review your trunk via email, make edits before it's shipped right to your door. Then you or your child will have five days to try on the clothes, keep what you like, and just send back the rest. Trunk Club is not a subscription service and shipping is always free. Trunk Club is backed by Nordstrom, which means they have the highest standards and quality and customer service. And if you live in Dallas, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, or DC, you can stop by one of the Trunk Club clubhouses to work with your stylist in person for free. Premium clothes, expert advice, no work, thanks to your very own personal stylist at Trunk Club. Get started today at trunkclub.com slash TNT. That's trunkclub.com slash TNT. And we thank Trunk Club for their support. This morning, a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket exploded on the launch pad. Here to talk about why this is an even more catastrophic event than you might think at first, we have Charles Pulliam Moore from Fusion. Welcome back, Charles. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much. How are you? So, I'm good. Let's start with the basics. Uh, do they have any yeah. idea why the rocket exploded? Um, yeah, so I think that everyone was sort of disappointed to hear about what happened today because of the recent spate of success that SpaceX has had with launching rockets. Um, in the past eight months or so, they've had five successful launches and then uh, touchdowns uh, where, you know, the rocket's gone up, it's come back, it's come back in one piece. Um, and the goal is to have these things basically be reusable. Um, that being said, everyone was sort of like, ah, like this is so terrible, what happened? What actually went wrong today had nothing to do with the rocket itself. It was with the launch pad. Um, upgrades had recently been made that should have actually made it easier for the rocket to engage and disengage. Um, and today was not actually the scheduled flight date, but it was rather just a test to make sure that the launch pad, uh, the launch pads and mechanisms would work. Um, that was not the case. Um, and unfortunately, both the Falcon 9 and its payload of the satellite were compromised. So tell us about that satellite. That's the important part of this story. Great. Uh, so the Falcon 9 was carrying um, an Amos 6 communication satellite um, that was a part of Facebook's really large plan um, for Internet.org. Um, Internet.org being this massive moonshot idea to essentially provide uh, high-speed broadband internet service to underserved um, underserved air, uh, parts of the world. This particular satellite um, was designed to provide service to sub-Saharan Africa. And had the satellite actually successfully made it into orbit, it would have been able to basically target broadband at will um, to areas that, other, that don't necessarily have the infrastructure for uh, high-speed internet access. Obviously, a really big priority for Facebook. Um, Zuckerberg's yeah. talked about this a lot over the last, you know, year, a couple of years, especially, and had some friction along the way in, in certain areas of the, of the world. Yeah. But um, so, how long has Facebook been developing this rocket, and what is the cost to them specifically? Oh goodness! So this is sort of like the big number that everyone's running around with. Uh, Facebook is going to have to eat the cost of about uh, two hundred million dollars for the satellite. Um, this was not just um, a lark. This has been um, in the making for quite a while now. Um, suffice it to say that there was definitely insurance taken out on this. I mean, these kinds of things happen, right? Um, when you're trying to launch these projects that are sensibly meant to change the world, um, you don't really go out looking to change the world without thinking that there might be a little bit of risk involved. Sure. Yeah, I think actually, I mean, along those lines, from what I was reading, statistics say one in nine U.S. launches will fail. So when you're talking right. statistics like that, you buy insurance of some sort. But I had also read that, uh, you know, the traditional insurance wouldn't actually uh, cover this because it was pre-launch. It wasn't actually during an actual launch. It was uh, before that. Right. And I think that like, the, the smartest way to look at it is just sort of like if there is actually going to be a market change in the way that we think about access to the Internet as a basic um, human rights necessity, mm -hmm. um, at some point, you know, who is going to eat the cost of that kind of progress, right? 
Um, it's great that Elon Musk, SpaceX, Facebook and co are willing and so ready to be able to take on these kinds of endeavors because we're not for that kind of philanthropy. Who's to say that moonshots like this would ever be greenlit in the first place? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 200 million sounds like a lot to us, but not really to Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a, a, a roll of toilet paper to Facebook, basically. Right. They go, they go to the, the hardware store and, and pick up a, a nail. That's basically the equivalent of that. And it's also important to to also remember um, that internet. this was not internet.org's internet only like entree. Um, into providing easy access to um, internet or uh, to the internet for people, um, uh, the on the ground approach um, is also to provide more robust um, cell uh, cell phone infrastructure on the ground in sub-Saharan Africa that would ostensibly provide a comparable service. It's obviously not the same, but again, like it's a multi-tiered approach to sort of getting everyone at a certain kind of like net parity. Mm -hmm. We should also say that the launch pad was clear, so no no people were harmed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, completely unmanned. Um, it's just everyone's really kind of were it not for the fact that the satellite itself had been compromised. This would have been a fairly run of the mill kind of mishap. Now, was this uh, satellite, this Amos communication satellite, was it in the news or was this something that Facebook was sort of hiding um, or keeping under wraps or was this something that most people knew about? Um, this is something like, so Facebook was actually pretty transparent about the fact that it was putting the satellite up into orbit. Um, as a part of a joint venture with a French telecommunication service. Let me pull them up right now. My computer has just died on me. I want to call them Yucatel, but do not quote me on that. Udelstat? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, Udelstat. There Udelstat. we go. <laughs> so Facebook, together with Udelstat, um, had signed into a $95 million leasing deal over the next five years. Um, that would have been mutually beneficial for the two of them. So this isn't, you know... It's not like a secret nefarious plot that Facebook was up to. This was very much something that they were um, publicly, you know, very gung ho about getting out there. Right. That's it was true. good PR, right? I mean, definitely. Yeah. yeah. But, and this doesn't necessarily put a stop to their plans. They have plans beyond just this, right? It's just not going to be as immediate as, as I think they had hoped. Definitely. I think that just because this was coming off the tail end of so many successful SpaceX launches, um, this really would have been the nice cherry on top that mm -hmm. said, you know, we're not just doing this um, for demonstration's sake. Um, this isn't just to show you that we have the technology. It's that this technology that we're spending so much money on um, can have these real world benefits. Um, and I think that we should all assume that there will be a comparable launch, not necessarily next month, but within the next couple of years that is going to try the exact same thing. Because again, um, this was a freak accident um, that resulted from the changing of procedure. Um, and you know, you learn from these kinds of things. And maybe next time when they're testing for the launch, they won't put the $200 million satellite on there until they're actually ready to go. <laughs> One would imagine, yeah. Yeah, Facebook also has their Aquila uh, plane mm -hmm. with, with the internet Drones. kind of stuff inside to um, spread an internet across like uh, sub-Saharan Africa and, and other places too. So they've got they've got a lot of, of, of action happening, and, uh, you know, along this effort, not just this one. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Charles. Charles Blaine thank Moore you. is at thank Fusion. You. He covers comics, just general geekery. Uh, true. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I love your pieces. I, I love your tweets. Thanks so much for coming on. And uh, he's also on Twitter at Charles Pulliam. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, guys. So I dug deep oh, into yeah? the mailbag today uh, to find an email from, from Gerald about our discussion a few weeks ago about Tim Cook's track record as compared to Steve Jobs. I thought it was worth reading now in light of Cook's business dealings in Ireland that are back in the news. Gerald writes, while Jobs was an innovator, Cook is a businessman. Don't forget Jobs was against the App Store with slowing growth in handsets plus cheaper avail cheap, more cheaply available iPhones. The App Store is now what is generating growth at Apple. Tim Cook has been focusing on that to keep them moving forward. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The serv services is what they're talking about For now sure. a mm -hmm. lot. So, Also, thank you to everyone who responded to our Pinch and Zoom story. <laughs> Alex, Nick, Phil, John, and our own Burke McQuinn all say they pinch and they sometimes even Zoom. Hmm, I feel like I know a little too much about Burke now. Coming up, more pre-IFA announcements, because IFA hasn't even started yet, yet we know everything about it. Uh, but first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter. They're the sponsor of this episode. Hey, you, yeah, you, look at me. Tell me, are you hiring? Yeah? Well, how about this? Search inside yourself. 
and tell me this. Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Yeah? I didn't think so. Don't worry. I'm not judging you, okay? Maybe I'm judging you a little bit, but it's, it's for your own good. See, I can help you because you surely know by now that posting jobs in one place, it's not enough to find quality candidates. Yeah, I hear you. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all top job sites. And now you can. It's easy. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job boards, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with a single click. Just post one time, and you'll watch your candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. You search by skills, location, work experience, and more. ZipRecruiter's advanced matching technology delivers the most relevant candidates based on your criteria. ZipRecruiter offers optimized pages, that look good on any screen. You can add their unique mobile apply process for more visitors, more applicants. You'll find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. So no more juggling emails or even calls to your office. You don't have to do that here. You can also add multiple users to your account to help you manage it all. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 1 million businesses and is trusted by hundreds of Fortune 500 companies. More than 125 million candidate applications have been delivered whether you're hiring now, it sounds like you are, or whether you plan to hire in the near future, check out their blog for recruiting tips and hiring resources. Right now, you can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. All you have to do is go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. ZipRecruiter is the fastest way to hire great people. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT, and we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. Okay, day two of pre ifa because IFA doesn't actually begin until tomorrow officially, so this is like day negative one of IFA, uh, to be fair. Uh, and that isn't stopping pretty much any company from unleashing their hounds with product announcements. Let's check out a few of those from the past 24 hours. First, we have Sony. Sony showed off a ton of new products from headphones to wearables to well, phones, but let's start with the $3,200 gold-plated Walkman. You know, it's for the it's a gadget for the casual music <laughs> listener. It's a premium upgrade to the ZX2 Walkman from last year. Has lossless audio support. Uh, it also has some uh, hardware tweaks underneath to prevent, they say, subtle interference. This is probably stuff that only audiophiles are actually going to hear the difference uh, in this regard has a copper body underneath the gold plating. So you have the gold plating on the outside to wow people with, and then that copper body underneath actually reduces things like magnetic interference. Uh, so, you know, so you can prevent interference and make it sound better, improve digital to audio or analog uh, conversion. I don't know, $3,200 Walkman. Will you buy one? Well, I'm wondering if I could just take my Walkman from 1987 and dip it in gold. And hmm. would it be the same thing? I wonder if it would work after you did that, though. <laughs> probably not. And the sound wouldn't be that great either. Yeah. I don't know if it um, would improve the sound. I'm probably not going to buy it. I okay. did, you know, Padre and Brian are at IFA, and I did ask them to check it out. Um, oh, okay. And uh, do a segment with it, see if it's worth it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine that it is worth it. They, but. You never know. If you go to the Sony booth, I mean, if they're really pushing hard to get this product out the door and to get people excited about it, they might just give one to, to Padre or Brian. Probably. Or Padre and Brian. Maybe maybe they will, yeah. I, that sounds totally realistic. But it's just a Walkman? I mean, does it do anything else except sound really good? Like No, it's it's pretty much a high, qu high quality, high fidelity. So it doesn't uh, turn into a self-driving car? Nope. It doesn't do virtual reality? No, none of that, no. Uh, it, I can't wear it. Uh, well, you could possibly, you know, tie it to like a necklace and wear it around your <laughs> neck or something, okay. but that's about it. All right. Uh, so I'm, I'm gathering from you that you don't think $3,200 is... is uh, no. It is in yeah something you want to spend. Well, there is a one thousand one hundred ninety nine dollar and ninety nine cent oh. version of this. It's stripped down. It's a standard version. It doesn't have all the gold. It has a little bit less of the circuitry. Mm. Maybe that's better for you. Maybe. More ideal. Is it silver? Only yeah, yeah I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> Bronze. So if you perhaps. like silver more than you like gold, you're okay. gonna save a couple of thousand dollars. Sony also showed off a few new phones: the Xperia XZ and the X Compact. Uh, the X Compact is for fans of small phones has a 4.6 inch 720p display, Snapdragon 650 processor, so definitely a step down processor uh, from premium processors, three gigs of RAM, up to 32 gigs of storage. They didn't list pricing uh, at this point, but last year's model, uh, based on that, it's probably gonna sit somewhere around 450, $500 right around there. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, no one's making, <laughs> well, few companies anyways are making the smaller form factor phones, but there's still a decent amount of people that really want these smaller phones. Uh, yeah, I uh, I like what those look like. Um, they are supposed to have a great camera mm -hmm. in there, and I would also like to know what Padre thought of the camera because Engadget liked it, but The Verge was not impressed. Yeah, with it. right. So I saw that, I saw that too. The Verge was not impressed. So hopefully they'll check that out while they're there. Uh, the other one, of course, I mentioned it briefly, the XZ, the Xperia XZ, which is kind of like a flagship level phone, larger screen, 5.2 inch, 1080p display, Snapdragon 820 processor, which is pretty standard, you know, premium high-end uh, processor right now in Android phones, three gigs of RAM, 32 gig storage, micro SD, USB-C, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no pricing on that one, but definitely more. What do you think about those really rectangular shaped phones versus the ones with the sort of soft edges? Like, kind of do you this, like those? The rounded edges? I mean, I think, you know, everybody has a different preference, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, for me personally, it's not my aesthetic. I like things to be a little bit more rounded, I suppose. Um, but Sony, Sony doesn't, has a hard time in the U.S. market for whatever reason. I'm not sure if they're approaching the U.S. market properly because they just don't have a whole lot of mind share here when it comes to smartphones mm -hmm. but sony has its hardcore ardent fans and they actually really do love the sony kind of design which has always been very kind of rigid you know rigid edges uh boxy kind of structure so uh definitely has his fans it's just not my cup of tea i mm -hmm. guess uh next up is Qualcomm, and they showed off their own take on virtual reality hardware with a reference design based on their new Snapdragon VR820 architecture. The 820 chip, like I was just saying, it's one of the most popular high-end mobile chips for smartphones right now. And uh, this basically just builds on that, they say, by doing what the 820 chips can't when it comes to mobile VR, and they're working it into this reference design. The headset on display that you see right here won't be available to consumers, but was shown off to hopefully get OEMs to kind of build their own hardware based on the VR 820 chip. And some of the interesting different things that this headset is doing uh, versus what we've seen before, especially with mobile VR, it includes eye tracking, so uh, using two cameras, uh, dual front-facing cameras, for out, uh, inside out positional tracking inside the room that sort of thing and then four microphones and i mean we talked a little bit about this eye tracking yesterday with sam Iskovich. Mm -hmm. so you know part of that it's kind of the same thing here where where you're looking you know kind of changes your perspective inside the experience and we were actually discussing yesterday how that would be re you know the next level type step um when you're talking about vr putting that into something vr and here you go well, it's, you know, it's just a prototype now, I guess. Addie Robertson from The Verge, who knows everything there is to know about VR, says she thinks they might be over-promising. Mm. Well, there are, there are a lot of things built into here that, make, that you don't necessarily see a lot of the others that are making these headsets, at least for mobile VR, doing right now. So... Yeah, maybe they have a, you know wide ambitions. I mean, we aren't even, we're going to see this later uh, this year, they say, Q4 uh, headset sometime soon after. But again, this is just a reference design for other people, other companies to kind of build their hardware out of, or, you know, or around. So it'd be interesting to see who kind of, you know, jumps on that bandwagon and if Adi is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Finally, there's HP, which is getting into the tech product as home appliance game with its newly announced Pavilion Wave. Looks a lot like a speaker. As you can see here, it's got a like a cloth cover uh, around it. So it totally looks like a speaker. A yeah, it looks speaker. like a Sonos. Right. But the company says it's meant to blend in with the home environment. They're all doing this these days. Uh, it's more than just a speaker, though. It's a computer that is, ba that is meant to basically be your home entertainment hub, and it's powered by Windows uh, 10 underneath. And as you can see, it's kind of like a triangular mini tower. It's pretty small. It's like 6.8 inches wide and 9 point you know, nine and a quarter inches tall, so pretty small. Uh, the speaker is capable of mono, mono audio, of course, because it's just one speaker, located in the center, and then the computer is, like, around that. So it's kind of an interesting design, a cool design. Uh, support for two 4K displays, lots of peripheral ports, of course, running 6th gen uh, Intel Core i7 quad-core processor, 549.99 and that'll be available at the end of this month. So it has Cortana controls. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean you can just speak to it like the Amazon Echo? 
That's a really good question, whether it can be in like a standalone mode. I know that the microphones that are built into it uh, allow for it to, you know, control Cortana, and that's what it's kind of designed to do. So, And the way that they've designed it, it really looks like a home appliance. So mm -hmm. that's the impression that I got. But I didn't see anybody playing around with it specifically just in that, you know, in that way. Mm -hmm. I don't see why not, though. It seems like it should be able to do that. So, I mean, the, the old gray box, like that was what it <laughs> used to be. And uh -huh. then, you know, back, back in, I don't know, the late 90s, early 2000s, probably started before, like people would mod them and, you know, make them look beautiful, make, you know, old computers look mm -hmm. beautiful. And they were really onto something because now it seems like there's so much part of our life yeah. that that's what we want. We want something that just fits into our living room. So, yeah. Well, and they need to be everywhere, like, or at least we think they need to be everywhere, right, in order for the added convenience of them. And, you know, who's going to put a huge desktop computer in their kitchen? Mm -hmm. uh, if you really want that technology in your kitchen or wherever it happens to be, then it almost needs to be out in the open. Mm -hmm. And so making it more like an, a, an, a home appliance as opposed to just this huge gray or black box. Right. Yeah, it's a good trend. I like that. I mean, you know, Apple has had like the Cube and, you know, they've had uh, PCs before that looked nice, but uh, they didn't have speakers in them or mm -hmm. microphones. Yeah. So. Or if they did have a speaker, they were tiny little ones that they just put in there for, right. for you know, very quiet system audio or mm -hmm. whatever. And now it's like a full, full yeah. feature. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's this slice of heaven. The HP Elite Slice. See what I did there? To be exact. It's a modular desktop computer and a small set-top box form factor, kind of like what you were talking about. But still, you know, here it's it's rounded a little bit more, so maybe it fits in a little bit better. It's kind of like a set-top box, hockey puck sort of uh, form factor. Uh, yes, it runs uh, Windows 10 Pro, and you can hook up displays, keyboards, peripherals. It has USB-C, USB 2 on board, as well as the Ethernet, of course, for connectivity. And like the Wave, it also has onboard microphones for uh, Cortana controls. Um, and it has a fingerprint sensor that's an option on the top. But the modularity is what sets this apart. It comes in the form of device-sized modular pads that the slice can just be sat on top of or they can sit on top of the slice. And that expands its functionality. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the uh, audio modules is a partnership with Bang & Olufsen that kind of expands on the audio capabilities mm. of the device. Uh, there's an optical disc drive. There's a, they call it a collaboration cover that turns the slice into a Skype for business phone. Oh. So these little things that just kind of connect, you know, it sits right on top of or however you want to um, position them. And uh, by doing so, it expands functionality in the same way that I, I suppose it would with your normal desktop computer if you were to put a, you know, peripheral card into it uh, for a specific thing. But here, what it also does is it kind of changes the functions of the buttons on top to reflect the device that you've uh, paired it with. So I don't know. I, I, anytime I see these sorts of things, I, I have to wonder whether support will actually kind of back it up. You know, mm -hmm. Will there be enough support for this for it to be a really cool feature? Or, I mean, if not many people are buying this, then there probably won't be very many peripherals made for it. And that would be a bummer. Exactly. Yeah. It's sort of that, like, the PC is not dead. We're not dead yet. Here's right. something pretty to put in your living room. We're doing innovative things. Really, we are. <laughs> Uh, 2017, uh, there's going to be a wireless charging cover for charging your devices on top of it and all that sort of stuff. So its base model is $700. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, uh, Padre and Brian are going to be showing off a lot of this stuff, maybe mm -hmm. even different stuff. There's a special tonight. It'll go all night. Um, starting oh, at 11 that, p.m. No. They're, they're going all night, people. Uh, if you want to see this stuff and more, I know there's a lot of stuff. Lots of people in the chat room are saying, like, what about this and this yeah, and this tablet and this? Uh, so that's where you find out all about that. Yeah, so, and we yeah we talked to Cream Corn Cobb in chat is asking about it. The uh, the 21 inch gaming laptop that we talked about, we about yesterday. yesterday. We talked about it yesterday. <laughs> uh, Five thousand dollars. I said it was ugly. <laughs> it was kind of ugly, but know, it's a, it, ugly. it has a purpose, you know. It was, yeah. Five thousand dollars—that's the price. Right. If you were thinking of getting one, you're going to need to spend five thousand dollars on that. Just saying. Mm -hmm. TNT's fan of the day is Trent Moody on Twitter. He sent us this picture saying, "I'm at my new desk, in my new office, in a new apartment, in a new state, with my new doctors behind me." I think. <laughs> 
<laughs> are we the doctors or is it the Doctor Who? <laughs> we're the doctors. I like to think we're the doctors of technology. We are the Doctor Who of technology. The Doctor, the doctor Who's. Uh, who? The Doctor Who? <laughs> the who? Doctor. who did you say? <laughs> of technology. Sometimes we're the Mulder and Scully of technology. Sometimes, as you yeah, that's vague, Trenton. Let us know. Are we the Doctor Who's? Yeah, or? I, I really want to know. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google+. Plus. Twitter or Facebook and use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we'll find it. Christina Warren from Gizmodo thinks you might want to buy somebody's old bathrobe. Find out who's in a minute. But first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker, the sponsor of this episode. There are advancements in technology. We have smart cars, smart phones, smart homes, everything we just talked about from IFA. All those things are very smart. But you might not feel very smart when you lose your possessions. Tracker makes losing things a thing of the past. The Tracker Bravo locates misplaced keys, wallets, computers, backpacks, bicycles, even pets in seconds. The device is constructed with anodized aluminum for the thinnest, most durable tracking. You can easily attach it to your items via the key loop or the adhesive or just pop it in your wallet. It's coin sized. Tracker is enabled by Bluetooth LE so the battery lasts up to one year. You can add a laser engraved message to each Tracker Bravo. You can now personalize your tracker with a custom printed image, whatever image you want. Here's mine. It has the tech news today image on it. We have one for iOS today. They made one for all of our shows. You can make one for whatever shows you watch, this one or other. Then pair your tracker to your iOS or your Android device. Find its precise location with the tap of a button. It is that easy. Your phone can track up to 10 devices at once. I'm currently using one to track my dog, my keys, my drone, and both of my kids' trumpets for band. Uh, it has been very helpful. You can also customize two-way separation alerts so you're notified before you leave your item behind. If you lose your phone, press the button on the tracker and your phone will ring, even if your phone's on silent. Tracker Atlas works with your Tracker Bravo or third-party Bluetooth tracker to pinpoint your items on a customized floor plan of your home. So there are over 1.5 million devices out there. So Tracker has the largest crowdsourced GPS network in the world. So your lost item shows up on a map, even if it's miles away. If you lose your item, the Tracker app records its last known location on a map. When another Tracker user comes within a 100-foot range of your item, you will receive a GPS update of where your item is located. Go to tracker.com never lose your possessions again. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter promo code TNT, you will get 30% off your entire order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R dot com, promo code TNT for 30% off your whole order. So, Megan. Yes. Have Jason. you ever wanted your very own Steve Jobs turtleneck? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Or maybe you've been pining to own an old... I'm talking really old Sony portable CD player, maybe? I don't know. Maybe I can drop it in gold and mm. charge $3,000 for it. Sure, you might as well. <laughs> I hope you're ready to open up your pocketbook because tons of Steve Jobs stuff is up for auction this month, courtesy of the Jackling House, a Woodside mansion that Steve actually lived in uh, during the 80s. Uh, items include a Next turtleneck from his time at, with Next, mm. a, ta a tattered and worn brown bathrobe that the, you might want. The bathrobe comes with two razors and it's, it wasn't clear <laughs> if they were Steve Jobs' razors. They better be. They weren't clear if it, they were his head razors or his face razors. <clears throat> that wasn't clear. Um, oh, before man, I put my so money down, weird. I need to know if yeah. It's a Christian Dior bathrobe. Okay. It still <laughs> looks tattered and worn. Like, it was obviously a bathrobe that he wore. It's Steve Jobs' bathrobe. Okay. And it starts at $200. That's <clears throat> the crazy part. Act now, and you'll also receive a pocket full of razors. Uh, a collection of keys to who knows what is also part of this collection. Ooh. I mean, there, there's, every, there's like a wallet in here, which you could get to replace your pocketbook. That you could put your money for the auction items uh, from this auction in. <laughs> you probably don't use a wallet. Uh, I use a wallet. Not a Steve Jobs wallet. Uh, I wallet. would. I mean, this book. <laughs> called the Regis Touch Million Dollar Advice from America's top marketing consultant, Regis McKenna. Do you think you ever read that? Um, I don't know. I mean, I read Steve Jobs' biography, and he never mentions him as one of, you know, Walter Isaacson never talks about Regis McKenna in there as one of his big influencers. Yeah, so. I don't know. It's like, a, it's like going to a thrift store, but where a thrift store, you know, carries nothing but items from millionaires. This but is, am I right that it's for charity? 
I think it's for a charity. It has to be for charity. I, I missed that because I was so <laughs> gaga over the items and going, really? Really? You're going to pay that? Okay. All right. Somebody's going to pay it. Has it has to be for charity. Must so be. it's for charity. All right. Then do it. Get, get yourself a Steve Jobs turtleneck that says next on it. For I charity. Approve. For charity. For the kids. <laughs> for the kids. Do it for the kids. Uh, tomorrow's guest will be Ian Thompson from the Register uh, because I will not be here. And I'm very sorry. I forgot to remind you about that until earlier today. You're like, wait a minute. Huh? Um, yeah, I'm going camping. Remember remember a while back we were talking about stargazing mm -hmm. on a clear uh, starry night? Yes, that's, that's happening this I weekend. knew you were going camping. I just didn't want to believe it. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I won't be here. You will. Ian Thompson won't be here, but he'll be here mm -hmm. in the monitor and... Uh, Life will be good. And he, he was here last week for Screensaver, so he has been here. Okay. Just not on weekdays because he has yeah. another job at the register. He's got a daytime job. Mm -hmm. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us. That's TNT at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voice veil. That's 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. Go to Teespring if you want uh, our new logo, our East Side Studios <gasps> logo on a shirt East or side. a mug or a hoodie. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a great logo. So Teespring, it's a limited time only. Uh, but you know what not, what's not limited? What? The ability to subscribe to this show. It is not limited Unlimited. time. Unlimited. But do it now just mm -hmm. in case. You yeah. never know. Twit.tv slash TNT. <laughs> And I am on Twitter at Megan Maroney for a, not a limited time, for unlimited, unlimited time. Unlimited amounts of time until Twitter goes under because you know maybe that'll Leona? happen. I don't know anything, okay. but they just they have, they have issues that they need to work out. I'm just True. saying you should do that before you go away. Uh, and I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole. Thanks to Greg <laughs> for laughing only a couple of times today. Uh, thanks to Kevin for editing and making us look good. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone.